So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased today to introduce you to the Mr. Creepypasta Amino. This is the ultimate online community for Creepypasta fans. So, let's take a quick look around. Right, there's about 200 of us online right now. Let's see what we're doing. Uh, chatting. Uh, there's the new thing that we have for everyone, the uh, live voice call. A lot of people browsing. Here I am. There we go. I'm checking in. Now I'm logged into the system. There I am, Dr. Creepen. Okay, so what can I do in here? Right, I'm going to take a look into the red rooms. This is the new feature that allows you to voice chat with other people all around the world. Okay, so now we're back on the front page. Let's take a look at this video that someone's uh, put on. Okay, look at all those likes, people liking this one, people leaving lots of comments. Let's take a look further down. Fan art is another big thing on the Mr. Creepypasta Amino. Beautiful picture there. Okay, so there I am. Don't forget me. Come pay me a visit. Women were missing at the time this happened. I'd recently received a promotion when the State Bureau of Investigation. The first case I took the lead on was quite the undertaking. To be honest, I was in a little over my head. However, as I've always been a good actor, I disguised my insecurities well, I suppose, because the boss often encouraged me and told me what a great job I was doing. Where I live isn't exactly crucial to the story, but I can tell you it gets colder than a room full of ex-wives, and that's freezing, I assure you. I should know, I have three. One night, after I'd worked on the case for 14 hours, oh yes, yeah, so I needed a nice brew, some food, and sleep. That was all I had on my mind. It was also the first snowfall of the year. I've lived here most of my life, so driving in it's no big deal. I live in a rural area and drive to the city for work, so my commute is usually about 40 minutes. But nights like this one, well, it can take over an hour. Sometimes too, depending on how hard it's coming down. Even with all my training on how to drive in dangerous conditions, I don't take any chances. I've seen too many deaths along those stretches of road. My phone rang. I glanced at the phone on the dash and saw it was my father. It could wait until I got home. When I pulled into the drive of my house, I parked and got out. I tugged up my coat, sheltering myself from the wind and snow. When I got inside, I shook the snow off, took my cap off and tossed it, where it landed on a chair. I sat down on the stairs and pulled my boots off. I was just about to start up the fireplace when my phone rang again. This time, I answered. Yeah, what's up, Dad? It's your mom. She's missing. I sighed. This had been happening a lot lately. No, Dad. Remember? Mom's gone. She passed away. Oh, he said. Now, there's no need to worry. Is Danny there? Danny is my twin brother. When he wasn't out getting himself into some kind of trouble, Danny lived with Dad. The funny thing about Danny is, for all his selfish, ruthless behavior, he was fantastic with Dad. They had a special bond, and I was grateful because it prevented Dad from having to go into some kind of facility. We tried that, and Dad had been kicked out of two for feeling up some of the ladies. Dad's mind had changed, but he was still very strong and agile. Well, at least he still had that. Yup, Danny answered. Dad never said hang on or anything. He'd asked for Danny or whoever he was with, and he just handed the phone to them. God, it drove me crazy. Hey, can you redirect Dad? He's talking about Mom again. Eh, I know. I'll put on Matlock or something. That usually gets him refocused. I was busy working on something. Sorry, man. No problem. Listen, I'm beat. It was another 14-hour day, plus the commute. I gotta get some food and hit the hay. I hear you. How's that going, by the way? Ah, it is what it is. Seems there are a lot of lunatics out there, I answered. <laughs> For sure. I tell you, I don't think I could do what you do. Well, 
you do what you've got to do. Well, I think it's cool as hell. I wish I'd taken a different path in life. Danny sounded depressed. When Danny got depressed, I got worried. He made awful decisions when he was depressed. Uh, we all make our choices. Then we just live with them, good or bad. <sighs> Guess I should have made better choices, he said. Well, that's the past. Let's just deal with today. Right now, you're doing the most important thing you've ever done. You are taking care of Dad, and I appreciate that. So does he. Yeah, I know. All right, I'll let you go. You get some rest, he said. Will do. Hey, call me if you need me. I'll be at home tomorrow. We hung up, and I went to the kitchen to heat up my dinner. It was leftovers, but they were decent, and I didn't have to cook, so I was fine with that. I started the fireplace while the microwave did its thing. The grandfather clock chimed, a reminder of how late it was. The only thing about working long hours is, even if you are exhausted, you still need time to unwind. The problem with that is, whatever's kept you at work so long, well, it won't leave your brain. So much is swirling around up there, it's hard to gather it all up. Put it in a compartment and close the lid until the next day. Yep, the case consumed me, it took all my time. I felt I'd crack under the pressure, and everything I'd done to get to this place in my career would vanish if I didn't figure out a way to let it go once I got home. Yeah, and that's why I decided to actually take off a day or two. I knew I'd still work, even from home, but it was a break nonetheless. When my dinner was ready, I cracked open a beer and plopped down in my favorite recliner. I flipped on the TV just in time to catch a rerun of the evening news. I should have known better. And of course, the lead story was about the case. Everyone already knew there were six women missing within a 60-mile radius. I knew all of their faces. I could tell you every line, mole, pattern of freckles. I could tell you their education level, their families' names. Anything worth knowing about these women, I knew. Out there where miles and miles can separate homes, businesses and towns, there was a lot of ground to cover. There were trees, mountains, abandoned farms, but so far the authorities hadn't located them. Well, they could be anywhere. It was my job to use the information we had to get the best possible outcome. I didn't even know what best possible outcome meant anymore. I only knew, at some point, the perpetrator would stop. I fell asleep in front of the TV. The next morning I awoke with a pain in my neck and spilled beer on the floor. I started my coffee, cleaned up the mess and headed to the shower. After the shower I drank my coffee as I watched the snow fall. My phone rang. It was work. Hey, we caught a break. Someone spotted April Davis talking to two guys in a rust-colored Pontiac the night she went missing. The boss said, Where at? Outside Martindale Family Foods, he said. Oh, that's at least an hour from where she lived, I replied. I know. We've got guys headed that way to search for her car. The snow cover is pretty heavy by now, so it'll be a job to find it. We will. Listen. It's just a hunch, but let's start out toward the old train station and work our way in. The old train station? That's 80 miles out, he said. I know. We'll cover more ground that way. Okay. If you think so, we'll do it. I think you're wrong, but I'll send them that way anyway. Thanks. Keep me posted. We hung up. I went into my study, where I had maps and photos covering a wall. I searched and searched for anything I could have missed. Anything that would stick out to someone who looked at the evidence and photos with fresh eyes. I looked at it for at least an hour. I covered every single angle. And then, I had an epiphany. I called my boss. Hello? Hey, something just hit me. 
Remember those two guys we talked to back in September? Wilson and Stradlin? Well, they still never told us where they were the night April Davis went missing. Doesn't one of them drive an old brown car? Maybe the car was brown, not rust. Hmm, could be, he answered. I think we should bring them back in. Those boys have been in all kinds of trouble. Soliciting, drugs, burglary. I don't see how kidnapping or worse could be too far out of the realm of possibilities. Well, I know Stradlin did time for sexual assault. Yeah, let's bring them back in and have another chat. The boss didn't seem completely convinced, but it was enough to get the ball rolling. We hung up the phone and I started to shuffle through everything I had on hand. Tommy Stradlin, 36, single, unemployed, white male. Solicitation, sexual assault, armed robbery and theft. Michael Wilson, 34, ranch hand, white male. Possession of narcotics, armed robbery, domestic violence. These two were suspects to the nth degree. No one we'd talked to had a worse record. The more I put the pieces together, the more I was convinced. (sighs) We'd let these two waltz away. We had to get them back in. I worked another two hours, then decided to step outside. The snow was still falling. Just as I walked back in, the phone rang. Hey Danny, what's up? It's Dad. What about him? Danny stammered. He's not making any sense. What do you mean? He's just talking nonsense. I'm worried. Does he need a doctor? I asked. Hell, I don't know. You're the smart one. Hey, is it still snowing out there? No, it stopped a couple of hours ago, he answered. Can you get to the hospital? Probably. Okay, you need to head on out and I'll meet you there. It's going to take me a while, but I'll be there. Sure thing, Chief. Meet us there, he said. We hung up and I called the boss. Yep, he said. Hey, listen, my dad's not doing great. I've got to go out there to see what's going on. Can someone else handle the Wilson and Stradlin boys? Hadn't found them yet. Could be a day or two. Depends on if they're home or we got to track them down. Ah, gotcha. Call and let me know. Will do. Take care of your dad. We got it handled. He ended the call. It took me almost two hours to get back to my hometown. Dad was in an exam room when I arrived at the ER. I walked to the room where Danny was sitting next to the bed. (sighs) Thanks for coming. (laughs) Of course. He's my dad too. I said. Danny informed me that Dad had been sedated. That's why he was no longer rambling like a madman. We waited for the doctors to find a room to keep him overnight in for observation. I asked Danny what Dad had been saying. He's just talking nonsense. He's saying that shit about when he was younger, like he's still living during that time. I've never seen him like that. He's got to stop. What would someone else think if they heard him? If, as the dementia gets worse, yeah, they live in the past a lot, I said. Most of the time it's better just to appease him than to argue. I didn't argue with him, but when I saw he couldn't be redirected and he just kept going, well, that's when I called you. I cleared my throat and put my hand on Danny's. Look, I want to thank you for all you do. I'm really proud of you. Yeah, you made mistakes in the past, but you're making up for it now. You're doing what Dad needs you to do. Thanks. Danny hugged me, which was completely out of character for him. A little while passed before they came in to move Dad to a room. While they transported him, I went upstairs to get me and Danny some food. When I returned, Dad was mumbling, but the thoughts were so disorganized I couldn't make any sense of it. Danny and I ate, then took turns through the night, staying awake in case Dad needed us. I woke the next morning to the sound of the phone ringing. It was the boss. How's your dad? I sat up and reached for the cold coffee on the table next to me. (sighs) Fine. I sipped the coffee, just to wake up. 
As expected, it was awful, but not the first time I had drunk stale, cold coffee. Good. Then you'll be back sometime today? Probably. He did well last night. They'll probably change his meds and send him home. Treat him and street him. Yeah, that's right, he said. So, you wanted me back today. What do you got? Stradlin and Wilson. We found him last night. Down to that dive they hang out in. Sure enough, they were in that old brown car. Found a woman's size six shoe in the back seat of the car, too. Size six? Same as April Davis? Size six. Yep, same as April Davis. An added ass shoe just like the one she wore to work every day. <laughs> yes! My shouting woke up Danny. I mouthed the words, I'm sorry and made my way to the bathroom and shut the door. So, you think we got him? I asked. Well, we got a ways to go for a confession, but with enough pressure, I think they'll turn on one another. Waiting on a warrant on the house right now. I was thrilled. God, how would I miss the obvious? Why did we let them go the first time? I had to stay calm and level-headed until I got back to the office. I didn't want to get ahead of myself. I promised I'd be back later that day. When I came out of the bathroom, I told Danny I needed to return to work and was going to the house to shower and change before I headed back. He said he'd call if there were any updates with Dad. The sun was out and the snow from the day before had turned to slush. I drove back to the old farmhouse I'd grown up in. It always felt so strange there since Mum had passed away. It felt less like a home for some reason. Perhaps because she was the kind, affectionate one, whereas Dad had always pushed us. Do your best. Whatever you do, be the best at it. It always felt like too much to live up to. I walked in the door, and the stench of cigar smoke hit me. Oh, I hated that scent. Always have, always will. I walked upstairs to the bathroom and started the shower and got in. It felt good. I showered up and stepped out. I ran down the hall to Dad's room, dripping wet. <laughs> I'd forgotten my towel. Dad always kept a stash of them in his room. I opened the closet and grabbed one. I was in a hurry to get dressed and get to work. I pulled down my backup clothes from the top of the closet. I sat on the bed getting dressed when I noticed something I'd never seen before on my mum's side of the closet. A red ribbon hanging from a coat hanger. I knew that red ribbon. It was the same one Maggie Jones was wearing in the photo I had on the wall in my office. I told you, I had each photo memorized. I took a few deep breaths and finished getting dressed. The excitement of getting to work had overwhelmed me. I grabbed my dirty clothes and ran downstairs. I heard a whimper behind the closed door in the back of the house. <laughs> of course, Maggie. How had I forgotten to feed Maggie? Oh, I felt awful. I walked to the kitchen, snatched some food from the cupboard and opened the door. I threw the food down and she scooted toward it. With her hands and feet tied and a mouth gag, I wasn't sure how she'd eat it, but <laughs> that wasn't my problem. I had two guys back in town about to take the fall for a series of crimes in which I'd meticulously laid out and planted evidence. Oh, let me rephrase that because it sounds awful. I simply redirect it. He always said to be the best at what you do. You see... When I discovered my father was responsible for a string of unsolved abductions 40 years before, I never said a word. But when the time came, and he started living in the past, it all came up. I wanted his final years to be happy ones, and if that meant reliving the past, so be it. It's better to appease him.
Ah, go on, admit it. You didn't see that twist coming in the end, did you? <laughs> I certainly didn't. Wow, what a sneaky little bugger he was. Ah, I knew it had been too long since I read a Tiffany 360 story, and I think you can agree I was right. Well, glad to be back reading her work. <sighs> Ooh, that was a sneaky one, wasn't it? Well, I want to hear what you think about that story, so don't be shy. Let me know in the comment section below the vid. And... Because I love you all so much, I'm going to stick another one of her stories on the end. Now this is an old one, you might have heard it before, but it bears listening to again, definitely. And well, that's it for me for this evening, but I will be back on Wednesday, so make sure you join me again real soon. Okay? Alright my dears, bye bye for now. <laughs>
we could talk some more. Sure, sounds good to me. <laughs> Come on, what dude is going to turn down going back to a beautiful older girl's house? As she drove, I tried not to stare. I'd always thought she was cute, but something about the way the streetlights reflected on her dark tan made her almost glow. She seemed too good to be true. So, my professor was telling us more the other day about show, don't tell. He gave us some really good information. We'll look at it when we get back to my place. Professor? I thought she was older than college age. Yeah, you know, college professor. Oh, so you're in college? What year? I remembered you asked people in college what year they're in, not what grade. Oh, junior, she said as she shifted gears and we slowed down and stopped at the traffic lights. I did the math in my head, and that made her only about 20, maybe 21, something like that. Heck, maybe I did have a chance. She wasn't that much older than me. Um, so do you live in a dorm? Oh, God, no. I have an apartment. It's not much, but it's mine. The light changed and we started moving again. Cool. It wasn't long before we got to her house. Not much, I thought. Her apartment complex was awesome. She even had a garage for her car. She pushed a button and the garage door opened and we pulled in. I felt clammy, sweaty, and my heart was kind of racing. I'd never been alone in an apartment with a woman. I got out of the car and shut the door. As we were walking to the entrance, the garage door closed behind us. I couldn't see much and tripped over her bicycle. Oh, damn, sorry. I scrambled to pick it up. Oh, no worries. You can just leave it. I'll take care of it later. Okay. I followed her voice so I could get to the door, which was open by the time I got there. Come on in. It was really nice. I walked past the dining room and into the living room. Oh, you can just sit wherever. I'll be right back. She walked down the hallway. I looked around, and then scanned her bookshelf. Shh, there was some real crap there. Real crap, I tell you. Fifty Shades of Ugh, that stupid book. The Notebook, oh, classics by Danielle Steele, and a bunch of other garbage. How do I know these books are crap? Well, my aunt and older sister read them. Not quality literature, I can guarantee you. Trust me on this. Just don't. I picked up a composition book I saw and started to flip through it. It felt wrong, but I did it because... Oh, I don't know. I don't have an excuse. I just did it. It was some of Yana's writing, but not the normal kind of stuff she brings to us at the club. This was dark. Interesting. I mean... It was really dark, but I liked it. It was better than some of the real horror stories I've read, and I've read them all, it seems like. I heard her coming down the hall, so I shoved it back on the shelf, jogged over and tossed myself onto the couch. When she entered, she was wearing more casual clothes, had taken her makeup off and had pushed her hair back with a bandana. She sat down next to me on the couch, curling her legs up under her, and she scooted real close. I wasn't sure what to do, but I had a feeling she did. I turned my head to look at her. She dabbed the end of my nose with a finger and giggled. <laughs> You're cute, Charlie. Nobody ever calls me Charlie, I said, feeling the words catching my throat. Well, now they do. She simpered. Then she grabbed my face in her hands and started to kiss me. 
At first it was just small, light kisses, but that soon turned into a full-blown make-out session. She fell back onto the sofa, and I ran my hands all over her. I mean, all over. Our breathing got heavier, and I got more excited at the thought of being with a girl like this. I started preparing for the ride of my life. Do you have protection? I asked. She stopped, then started to laugh, throwing her head back on the arm of the sofa. <laughs> what? When she sat up, her hair fell down in her face. The bandana had slipped in the midst of all our rolling about. Um, you know, protection. She scooted back, away from me, just staring at me with a smirk on her face. Well, I don't want to do it without protection. <laughs> I'm too young to be a dad. Do what? She cupped her hand over her mouth and laughed. Oh, God, did you think I was actually going to? She clapped her hands and threw her head back. Oh, kid, I was just having a little fun. Do you think I would actually... With you? She tossed her head back again, laughing, laughing at me. I saw her long, tan neck, just there for the taking. I lunged at her, tightening the bandana that had slipped around her neck. I tightened, and I tightened. Her eyes bulged, and she started gasping for air. Oh, I failed to mention before. I outweighed her by at least 75 to 100 pounds, and stood at least a foot taller than her. All I could think about now was stealing that notebook and publishing the stories as my own. The way she'd laughed at me only fueled my anger. Her tiny frame was no match for me. I bared down as her bony hands gripped my wrists, trying to push me off of her. I continued to pull the bandana. Her movements weakened, until finally she grew limp, and her entire body was motionless. I sat, staring at her, probably in shock at what I'd done. I waited for a final gasp, watching her glazed over eyes, just staring. I waited for her to blink, then I felt something wet underneath us. I knew that this time she was gone. No breath, glassy eyes, and now the Yuri. Yeah, she was dead, and I had done it. I got up and moved over to a chair. I sat there, not knowing what to do. How would I ever get out of this? What would I ever say to the cops if they came looking for me? I knew I had maybe a couple of days, because who knew when someone would discover the body? I had to get out of there, and quick. So, I grabbed her notebook full of awesome writing, and took off. I knew there were fingerprints and fibers and everything all over the living room. DNA on her. There was no point in trying to cover my tracks. But if I were lucky, I'd have time to submit the stories. It took me an hour to walk home. But it didn't feel like that long because I was so excited. First, they'd have to find the body. Then start making the rounds and... You know the drill. So, I had to act fast. When I got home, I ran straight to my room, opened my laptop and started typing. I typed all of the stories. It took me all night. I typed this one, too. Then I started sending every single one of the stories to my favorite narrators. A couple of days passed when I saw the first narration, and then another. I was so excited to see all the positive comments. I didn't even care that the stories I'd submitted weren't mine. They liked me. When my favorite narrator contacted me and asked if this was fact or fiction, I didn't reply. 
It must not have mattered to him, because he agreed to read it, said he loved it. He might even be the one reading this to you right now. I sent out several, so we'll see what happens. I'll never know if they read the others. This being the internet and all the narrators might never find out about what I've done or who I am. I don't care. Because, for a little while, I knew what it felt like to be admired and liked. That doesn't happen often to guys like me. I probably won't be around to see what you think, but I know you will always wonder who really wrote the creepy pastors you listen to. Well, a shorter one for you tonight, but a pretty good one nonetheless. What do you think? Could it be true? Is it just a story like all the others? I know what I think, but nevertheless, I can't quite be sure. So, make sure you leave a comment below the vid and let me know your take on this story. Well, off you go. Relax. Have a good time. It's the weekend. You know what? I'll be back again on Monday. I hope you can all join me. But for now, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.